So I'm very happy now um, to introduce Gabriele Izoit from the Egalonian University. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'm really thankful for the opportunity to speak here and tell you about my research concerning brain state dependent responses of midbrain dopaminergic neurons to the aversive stimulus. Uh, so uh, to begin with, uh, as you may know, uh, VTA and SNC dopaminergic neurons can be divided based on their responses to aversive stimuli. And majority of uh, midbrain dopaminergic neurons respond to aversive stimuli such as electrical foot shocks or air puffs with inhibition of their activity. However, there is a fraction of uh, dopaminergic neurons that is excited by aversive stimuli. And those two types of uh, responses reflect two anatomically and functionally distinct dopaminergic populations, where the first of them is uh, thought to code information about the value of uh, perceived stimuli. And those neurons are excited by rewards and reward related cues, uh, coding in this manner for positive value of the stimuli. And they are inhibited by aversive cues or aversive stimuli. Uh, coding for the negative value of the event. Uh, second population is thought to code information about salience of stimuli. Uh, so those neurons are excited by both rewards and aversive stimuli, as well as reward uh, related cues and aversive cues. Uh, and many electrophysiological studies are performed on anesthetized animals. And one of particularly interesting anesthetics, at least from my point of view, is urethane. And here on the sonogram, you can see why I think so. Uh, here, the dominant frequency at given time is color coded. So the greener the color is, the more dominant the frequency is. And under urethane anesthesia, we can observe uh, spontaneous cyclic brain state alternations that can be divided into cortical activation, characterized by low theta frequencies around four to five hertz. And such frequencies can be observed in uh, freely moving animals EEG during immobile attentive states, such as freezing behavior. Second brain state is called slow wave activity as during this brain state, slow waves around one to two hertz dominate animals EEG and slow wave activity is usually associated with low arousal states such as non-REM phase of natural sleep. And from the previous study of our group, uh, we know that both pattern and level of midbrain dopaminergic neurons activity depends on the brain state under urethane anesthesia at given time. So during slow wave activity, those neurons tend to burst more and the level of activity is generally higher compared with uh, cortical activation when those neurons are more regular, non-bursting, and the level of activity is generally lower. Uh, so given this, uh, this knowledge, we, we asked ourselves a question, can responses of midbrain dopaminergic neurons to aversive stimulus depend on brain state as well? And to answer this question, we performed experiments on urethane anesthetized rats and recorded field potential from the hippocampus in order to monitor alternating slow wave activity and cortical activation, while uh, simultaneously we recorded single dopaminergic neurons activity from VTA and SNC and responses of those neurons to electrical foot shock applied to animals hint bone. Uh, all presented uh, neurons met uh, electrophysiological criteria for dopaminergic neurons, uh, and some of them were, uh, were act uh, additionally extracellularly labeled and later stained against uh, tyrosine hydroxylase or uh, optogenetically packed uh, using TH3 uh, animals injected into VTA and SNC with Cree dependent virus uh, carrying uh, genes for channel rhodopsin. So going into results, majority of uh, recorded neurons responded to electrical foot shock uh, with inhibition of their activity during both cortical activation and slow wave activity. And based on the literature, we classified those neurons as value coding dopaminergic neurons coding for negative value of electrical foot shock. Almost a quarter of uh, cells that we recorded 
responded to electrical foot shock with excitation during both cortical activation and slow wave activity. And according to literature, uh, we labeled those neurons as salient coding dopaminergic neurons. Uh, however, almost a third of recorded neurons responded to electrical foot shock in brain state dependent manner. And we labeled those neurons as switching dopaminergic neurons. And just in a second, you can see why. So majority of those neurons responded to electrical foot shock with inhibition of the activity during cortical activation. But as soon as the slow wave activity appeared, those neurons switched their response to electrical foot shock into excitatory one. And uh, so far, those neurons uh, were not described in literature, so we cannot prescribe them any function. Although later on, I will try to uh, share some ideas with you and hopefully uh, discuss it. And you can also uh, see very nicely those switching uh, dopaminergic responses at the level of whole population. Uh, both on those heat maps and pie charts, you can notice that during cortical activation, majority of uh, dopaminergic neurons is inhibited by electrical foot shock, and only a small fraction is excited by it. However, uh, when slow, activity, slow wave activity appears, a uh, percentage of neurons excited by electrical foot shock increases, while the percentage of neurons inhibited by it decreases. Uh, so we asked ourselves uh, why such responses have not been observed before. And one possible explanation that came to our minds was the type of anesthesia used during previous studies. Uh, so during previous studies, researchers supplemented uretane anesthesia with ketamine, uh, which is potent NMDA antagonist, and uh, xylazine, uh, which is alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. And you can see on the sonogram that such supplementation abolishes those cyclic brain state alternations observed under uretane anesthesia and evokes long-lasting and very stable slow wave activity. Uh, those brain state alternations eventually come back uh, as the ketamine and xylazine wanes, but they are not as powerful and regular as they were before. And uh, now I want to show you a neuron recorded throughout, throughout this period of time and its responses to electrical foot shock. So during cortical activation, uh, this neuron was unresponsive to electrical foot shock, uh, but during slow wave activity, uh, before the supplementation with ketamine and xylazine, this neuron was excited by electrical foot shock. So we would label uh, this cell as switching dopaminergic neuron. Later, uh, when the supplementation of uretane with ketamine and xylazine evokes slow wave activity, uh, this neuron was excited by electrical foot shock, uh, which is something that we would expect given that it was also excited uh, before the supplementation. Uh, however, uh, what we did not expect uh, is that after those cyclic brain state alternations uh, came back, uh, this neuron was excited by electrical foot shock during both cortical activation and slow wave activity. So as you could notice, uh, supplementation of uretane with ketamine and xylazine not only abolishes cyclic brain state alternations uh, under uretane anesthesia, but also disrupts the uh, switching type of response to electrical foot shock. Uh, we've managed to just cellularly label this neuron and it proved to be tyrosine hydroxylase positive, therefore dopaminergic uh, within the borders of SNC. Uh, we've also looked at spatial distribution of recorded neurons and it seems to us that there is no uh, specific uh, loca location of switching neurons within the VTA uh, or SNC. Uh, it seems like those neurons are evenly distributed uh, throughout those structures. Uh, so it's uh, hard for us to even speculate about possible in inputs to those neurons or outputs uh, from them. Uh, based on the anatomical segregation of neurons within VTA and SNC. Uh, but what I want you to remember from my today's talk uh, is that 
here we described uh, midbrain dopaminergic neurons that display brain state dependent responses to electrical foot shock. And the majority of those neurons is inhibited by electrical foot shock during cortical activation, but switches uh, its type of response to excitatory one during slow wave activity. And based purely on those responses that we can observe, uh, we hypothesize that this subpopulation may be involved in some kind of dual coding of both value and salience of stimulus, depending on the general state of the brain at given time. And as such, during behaviors characterized by cortical activation, for example, freezing behavior, information about negative value of the stimuli may be favored due to its involvement in learning of avoidance behaviors or learning in general. Uh, however, during sleep or low arousal states characterized by slow wave activity, recognition of stimuli as salient may help in orienting animals' attention, boosting cognitive processing, and result in general increase of alertness and arousal. Uh, and with this, I would like to thank the organizers once again for having me here, and thank you, dear audience, for listening. Great, thank you very much for the great talk. Um, Ryan, any questions? Sure. Um, Jan Rodriguez asked that, would you speculate whether these neurons activated by the shock signal, do they signal negative valence or rather high salience? I would rather say that they signal a high salience. Uh, well, just purely uh, based on the literature that we know that uh, those neurons uh, that code value of, of the stimuli are usually inhibited uh, by the aversive stimulus. Mm -hmm. And those that are excited are thought to code salience. Uh, however, I, I could uh, try to mix, uh, mix into it uh, theory about alerting neurons maybe maybe the purpose of the signaling is uh, alerting i see so i guess this is my, my follow-up question so you haven't really um looked at the response when they get the reward right no no uh it's it's really hard to uh, give anesthetized animal a uh, reward yeah, so sure. okay um, another question. So Armin Locke asks, uh, it seems that the baseline activity of these switching dopamine neurons also changed in, the in between two conditions. Is this the case? And can you speculate or comment on that, please? Oh, uh, the base basic activity. Uh, yeah, this is where our uh, experiments came from, actually, uh, that the previous study of our group uh, showed that the basal activity of dopaminergic neurons differs between those two brain states. And uh, I mentioned it during the introduction that uh, during a slow wave activity, the level of activity uh, is generally higher uh, and during cortical activation, it's lower uh, usually. Um, I have a question. Um, do you know how the inputs to the VTA are altered in, under uh, uh, urethane anesthesia compared to just um, sleep or wakefulness? Uh, for now, we, we don't know. Uh, we're, we're planning to look into uh, lateral habenula, but it is uh, very much involved in the aversive processing. Uh, so we're actually planning to do some experiments and verify uh, if this may be the, the case. Um, I was meaning more uh, the urethane anesthesia itself. How is it altering inputs to the VTA? Uh, you mean the activity in inputs to VTA? Yeah, the fact that you are delivering anesthesia is not like sleep. Um, and then whether there's any knowledge about uh, whether this state of urentine anesthesia is altering inputs to the VTA. So generally the VTA um, is less active during slow wave sleep. So presumably the urethane anesthesia is probably changing some of the inputs to induce more activity during slow wave sleep. So doing slow wave activity during urethane anesthesia, right? Yes, yes. but. Uh... 
there, as, as far as I know, there is uh, no information about it in the literature. Uh, but as I mentioned, we will try to look into some, some of the inputs. Uh, how they behave under urethane and if they may alter uh, what we see in the VTA. Great, thank you very much. Any, any more question, Ryan? Uh, I think we're good. I, I have a question actually. Um, so this kind of goes along with the question of um, the baseline firing rate being different during the slow wave activity and the cortical activation. But I was also wondering if the baseline activity could predict which type of cell it was going to be, if it was going to be a switching cell or a non-switching cell? Oh, yeah, that's actually really interesting, uh, but I don't think we've looked into it. Uh, I, I, I think we should. Yeah, it, it may be interesting. Maybe that's the case also.